Hello and welcome to the third Pokemon Zoology podcast, PZP. To those who've listened to the previous podcast, welcome back. Basically today we're going to be going through some of my Pokemon art that I've done this month. Um, we have Venomoth, uh, Xerneas and Flygon. Um, now I know a few of you are probably going, but I thought you said you're only doing the first 150. And technically yes, that is still true. But I've been very thankful uh, that I've had some commission pieces done, which is Xerneas and Flygon. Uh, from two incredible people who've uh, wanted to get some of their own artwork done um, and that is available to anyone if they wanted to I'm actually having a discount at the moment which is $1,000 for uh, one Pokemon picture um, of one Pokemon creature so if that's something that interests you then uh, give me a shout and I'm sure we can sort something out um, and I'm happy to do any Pokemon from any generation uh, you like so so today let's move on and we're going to look straight at the first picture which is Venomoth. Venomoth always one of those Pokemon that's kind of got lost in the background noise of Pokemon I think um, it's actually a very lovely Pokemon and really useful Pokemon I think mainly because Butterfree comes in so early in the game obviously when you catch Caterpie that uh, you know when it comes comes around to Venomoth unless you're really wanting a Venomoth you've kind of already got your paralysis and sleep tank if you know what I mean and so it's not never usually worth chasing but you know sometimes it's it's uh, it's a lovely change to have to have him on your team or have her on your team so when creating this one um, I actually used the Butterfree model as a base so it didn't take me forever um, to, to make it um, yeah and when I was thinking about like there were potentials here for me to deviate from the original design especially with its head and the horns that are on its head because I think a lot of people assume when you think of moths they have like the furry antennas and whatnot which look awesome but when I was looking at Venomoth I did consider it but realistically it just changed the silhouette way too much and made it unrecognizable I think and uh, it's such a distinct looking Pokemon that I didn't want to go too far away but one of the main like decisions that I made was that I wanted to bring in a level of fur into the design rather than kind of going um, for the kind of hard carapace thing with, with a lot of the other insects that I've done obviously a lot of moths are furry anyway so it made very it made sense to me to move down that that route but obviously fur is always a bit of a pain for me, <laughs> especially in 3D, but I knew that I could have a lot of fun with it. So when I went in, I took the uh, the wings from the Butterfree and I, and I changed them and I brought it all down to basics. So I stripped all the colours and I moved down the shapes and I, shaped, I, I made them into, into better proportions and stuff for Venomoth. And one of the main things I did, and if you are a Patreon follower, you'll be able to see the video that I'm uploading with this where I decided to paint on the eyes um, which I don't usually do now usually I go for just solid black eyes because it's a great way for when you move into um, like Keyshot and other renderers to get some strong reflections on the eyes and then paint the eyes in or matte paint the eyes in afterwards but this time because I wanted to kind of make sure that I was getting the right size um, and proportions I thought I'd just quickly paint in the eyes just so that I could get a good directional view so uh, yeah so I did that and uh, I, I you know I didn't actually have to change a huge amount because I already had um, a lot of the detail done through doing Butterfree but I went through and put in a few more extra textures and, and whatnot and made sure that when I painted it, poly painted it, that uh, all of the textures, you know, the colours were varied so it wasn't any block colours and, and whatnot and I think it turned out really well, I was quite happy. As many of you know, uh, when I first put out Venomoth, my, my, initial, my initial take on the eyes were less insect like i kind of wanted to go for kind of more of a liquid like like there was kind of like a liquid inside them um and kind of i don't know how to describe it really um i guess you could go say they were more mammalian but yeah it was once i put them out and i had some feedback from um 
from the audience, uh, my fans, I, I did reevaluate it and think, well, actually, yeah, maybe I do need to go back in and, and bring in some compound eyes rather than the, di- the direction that I originally went with. Um, a few people felt that this particular picture felt painting-like rather than the kind of stark 3D that they're used to. And to some extent, I see where they're coming from. But one of the main things about it was that I wanted to kind of give this um, mystic, magical kind of feel. Because in my head, I had this idea of these glowing, huge moths that were going through these forests and and shedding these glittering, sparkling trails behind them. Um, So adding in the glow definitely took some of the sharper edges off and made it feel maybe a little bit more painting-like. I also put in some textures uh, in post in Photoshop um, that were from real butterfly wings, um, well, real moth wings, and I think a few people felt that they felt a bit painting, though they are actually from real moss. Uh, maybe it's just the fact that they're scaled up and you can kind of see that, that detail a little bit more that makes it feel, I don't know, ever so slightly painted. But to be honest, I was really happy with it. I, I really liked the way it turned out and it was definitely how I wanted it in my head. I may well revisit Venomoth one day and do it in maybe a more of like a daytime scene. I think I just wanted to kind of have this kind of nighttime magical effect to it. So, and I achieved that, so I'm really happy with it. Um, yeah, so moving on to Xerneas. Um, so this was a commission from um, a lovely guy called Tate. Shout out to Tate who commissioned me to create a Xerneas. It was the first time, obviously I'd done Legendaries before, I'd done Mew and Mewtwo, um, had a lot of fun with them. But this one was the first time that I was kind of trying to catch that element of majesty and mystery uh, that maybe I haven't done before with, with my work. Some of the things that we discussed while creating it was its environment and to have it in these this kind of huge old forest with these giant redwood trees, uh, very kind of like Studio Ghibli-esque. Um, if any of you have ever seen Princess Mononoke, you, you'll probably understand where I was going with that. And uh, yeah, and approaching this, I was looking very much at real stags and how their fur sits on their body and how they have these relatively thick necks, um, which is mainly their mane that's built up with lots and lots of fur, and how they have this kind of like shaggy fur on their chest. But one of the main things anatomically is that obviously these the, their antlers that they have, these huge horns, are very heavy and they need a lot of a lot of strength in their body to hold them up and uh, especially in their chest and neck area. And even though I know that Xerneas was very elegant and had uh, had like quite thin features, um, I made the decision to kind of bulk it up ever so slightly just to give it that feel that it could actually hold these antlers up. And I know some people would say, well, it's a legendary, so you don't have to do that. You can just kind of like blame it on magic. But obviously, you know, my, my goal is to try and make these feel like they could be real animals and and. I think by going towards the kind of fantasy element would have taken away from that a little bit. Obviously, you know, people are going to have their different ideas. Um, I talked through extensively with Tate and what he imagined and my ideas from it. And I only ever did stuff that he was really happy with, um, that we were both happy with. And yeah, and and I did some rough sketches for him. Um, And he really liked the ideas, um, especially with the feet. Obviously, Xerneas' real feet are kind of like swords almost. But I was moving towards the realistic element. So I decided to kind of have the sharp points on his feet more um, a design feature, kind of like uh, patterns on its fur, rather than the fact that it's actually got these sharp pointed feet um, and kept hooves Um, underneath those but I wanted them to be black so the idea would be that from a distance uh, you might not be able to see those against the uh, against the uh, ground plane and and it would look like he's got these pointed golden feet but you know I was really happy with it and we moved forward into 3D and one of the things that I did to save myself time was to use an old model of um, a stag that I had um, and repurpose that which was which again saved a lot of time 
and I'm never, you know, a lot of people say to me, like, if they know that I've repurposed some some old models, they're like, oh, you know, do you think that's cheating or anything? Like that? And I've always said, like, as an artist, you use the tools that are available to you. And if you can find ways of uh, cutting down time, um, then I would say go for it. Obviously, as long as you're not you know, <laughs> screwing anybody else over, um, I always say, like, you know, try and try and aim to, to cut down the time because in the industry you're going to have people turning around to you and saying we need this by tomorrow morning and you know you don't have forever to to sculpt something from scratch um sadly so so i so i used that and it did it definitely helped and um i had a lot of fun figuring out the horns and and how the uh, the glowing elements in the uh, kind of crystalline designs worked um I think I created the horns and then I reduced the I duplicated them, reduced the size of uh, the initial horn, um, so that when I went into Keyshot, I could set the smaller horns that were inside the original horns as light fixtures, so that they created those glowing elements. Um, I did go in and and kind of boost those once I was in Photoshop but uh, it was a really great way of, of kind of creating this almost kind of energy electricity kind of vibe <laughs> kind of like a neon light looking thing but yeah I was really happy with that t how that turned out when I was playing with the fur the short hair is absolutely fine um, but when it comes to the long hair especially on the protrusions coming from its chest it took me a while to kind of like make sure that the fur felt real and felt like it was flowing in the right directions and stuff as Many people will know whoever's used uh, fiber mesh in ZBrush, it can be quite temperamental um, and takes a while to kind of teasing and playing with it to get it right. Unfortunately, I've yet to figure out how to make it work as if an actual brush. So the, the tools that you're given in ZBrush tend to pull the fiber mesh towards the screen rather than go with the flow of the brush that you're you're doing so it takes some time of moving the camera around and making sure that it's going in the right direction and you're not pulling it too far in one direction or the other but once you get it you, it's it's great and it's a wonderful tool i know there are other um programs out there like uh, maya and and whatnot that have some fantastic fur tools um and it is a shame that ZBrush haven't yet implemented similar things um, but uh, you know time will tell maybe they will so when I when I took it into Photoshop and I was compositing it I really wanted to have these this kind of water element and so I did that you know there was a reflection of the of the color bouncing off and I initially built the composition out and realized that actually the horns were quite large and if I actually wanted to fit it entirely into the portrait image that I was creating that there were going to be an element of cutting off the horns and stuff now the thing is that some people say like oh well, you know it should all be in the picture and actually when you're looking at a lot of artwork there's there are elements of cutting off things it, it's about what you want the eye to focus on so for this I wanted them to focus mainly on the face and then travel up the horn so it didn't really bother me that much that um, some of the horns were cut off I do have a longer version um, obviously that wouldn't be in print but you know I, I, I really enjoyed making this and I think the composition worked out really well um, some people felt that it looked a little small in the picture but I think that's because of the size of the redwood trees and it's really hard when you don't have a clear focus on size perspective um, to kind of guide that and the thing is with these Pokemon pictures you know I am I am kind of focusing on the Pokemon I do occasionally put in small animals and stuff like that um, for size, but I felt that when working with this one, I felt like if I started putting in birds or squirrels or, or whatever, that um, it would draw the eye away from the main focus. I think the thing is, is when you look at it and you understand that it's in a giant red f redwood forest, then it's quite easy to understand it and see its size and majesty. Um, but I, I understood why some people, when they first looked at it, thought that it looked more like the size of a, a normal deer rather than, you know, an eight or nine foot tall legendary being. But yeah, you know, I, I, 
I really enjoyed doing this one. Um, really happy the way it turned out. Got a daily deviation on DeviantArt, which was quite cool. <laughs> um, and I know that Tate was very, very happy with it. And he's been wonderful in the sense that I'm now, I, he's allowed me to create prints of it and and eventually that will end up on uh, Etsy as well so you'll be able to get your very own copy when that goes live next we've got Flygon now this is this was commissioned by a lovely lady called Bonnie um, again shout out to Bonnie thank you so much and she and like both Tate and Bonnie have been absolutely wonderful to work with and they've been excited throughout the whole process and it's been it's been great kind of giving them updates and showing them what what i've been doing with bonnie we discussed about how flygon was initially going to look because obviously it is it is a dragon type pokemon but its earlier uh, pre-evolutions um are obviously in the bug category and um i think it's still in the bug egg group but we discussed it and felt that actually for the final design of this we we really liked the um the aspect of it being more reptilian and more dragon like than maybe an insect basically so we decided to go down that direction and um you know i was really happy with that choice i've seen some other artists who've done flygon before and they've they've gone down the reptilian route and i think they've done some fantastic work as well so one of the main things that we discussed was Flygon's feet. Obviously the original design of Flygon it has kind of like just round featureless feet essentially but as part of the design and the idea that we you know we were leaning towards the idea that it's being a, a kind of like a desert reptile and clinging onto cliffs and all this kind of stuff that uh, giving him claws would be the best option um, and you know I don't always deviate from the original design I do try and push towards making it as close as possible but sometimes I'll I'll move away ever so slightly in certain areas just to kind of bring that realism up so when so I sculpted out the uh, the body and we um, had a lot of fun with that and you know I, I think a lot of people know that I enjoy creating my dinosaurs though to be honest I haven't actually done a dinosaur in a while now I need to make some time for that but uh yeah I, I love doing dinosaurs and uh, so this was right up my alley and I had some fantastic alphas um it was a mixture of both alphas uh that I had downloaded uh from some other talented artists and then ones I created myself so it was a good blend so I worked through that and I think and with the wings I was looking at was a mixture of uh, flying reptiles, modern day flying reptiles. Now they have a unique thing where their ribs actually stretch out to create their, their kind of webbed wings. Um, and even though technically I could go down that route with Flygon, I kind of wanted to hint at it rather than actually kind of fully make it its ribs. Just because of like the kind of theropod route I went down. But then I also looked at other prehistoric reptiles like Dimorphodon and, and other creatures like that that had these huge sails. And I kind of decided that these weren't ever going to be powered flight wings. So like if you look at like an eagle or something along those lines, they have very large chest muscles and uh, their wings are generally their arms. Whereas this one, I kind of wanted to make them more like gliders. So they don't have the, the same kind of muscle power that maybe you would on on something like an eagle or a bat so yeah they don't they don't in my eyes they don't have powered flight but it worked really well in the idea that the environment that they were in was uh this kind of canyon or desert canyon environment and they could leap from these ta high towers from cliff edge to cliff edge so it worked really well and um when we we're developing it um i said to to bonnie if she if she would like me to kind of put another one in the background maybe um because that one it would really show off the idea that i had of how they they would glide and yes yeah, so i so i went through i had a little bit of trouble with managing the um colors in this one um obviously it's it's a dry environment but then they are very bright green um which is is if sometimes it feels like a contradiction because you think something that is brightly colored would stand out really badly in 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 a kind of a, a arid environment but uh a lot of reptiles do and sometimes it's due to like a warning signal basically they're really toxic 
and they're kind of sending out a warning to predators to say, do not eat me because you will die. Um, <laughs> and maybe I, I imagine there's other animals that kind of end up growing so large or uh, have no competition or don't have any natural predators. So they can grow to larger sizes and they can get have brighter colours to try and attract mates and whatnot. Um, so therefore they don't really have much need for camouflage. I did kind of like the idea of maybe Flygon being in the realm of a kind of like a chameleon and being able to have the ability to change its colours. But obviously that's not in Pokemon canon, so I didn't want to kind of go into that too much. But when I was creating its eye, I had that in mind because they obviously have these big bulbous uh, kind of glass-like eyes. And I wanted to kind of have this idea that the red part of their eye is uh, is kind of like a protective shield for when they're flying in sandstorms and, and other elements like that. But their eye inside moved very similar to that of a chameleon and could and had her full rotation. So um, it kind of gave it gave a reason for why their eye was so bulbous and uh, also just kind of looked really cool. <laughs> so yeah, I was really happy with the way this turned out. The environment took a bit of tweaking uh, till I was really happy but once I hit that sweet spot I was I was really chuffed with it and and so was Bonnie so yeah so once again Bonnie has been absolutely fantastic and said that I am allowed to sell prints of this so like Xerneas this will be on my Etsy uh, page soon and as soon as I do I'll let everyone know and also let Tate and Bonnie know and I'll send them a selection of prints um, of all sizes as part of the commission uh, so they'll get those as well um, as I said if you wanted to get a commission um, I am doing uh, a deal for a full picture uh, usually these take about three days to do so you know not to be funny but it's, it's, it's a big drop from my usual rate so working in the industry so you know you're getting kind of getting a good deal out of this I believe so yeah so those were the three pictures that I worked on this month um, I'm going to be working on Nidorino Rhino next and I know that's been a while it's just I've had these commissions and I've had some other things happening in my life so um, I've been a bit distracted um, but when uh, but that will be done soon so I'll be cracking on with that next for sure and finally we've got a few questions um, some of them have come from the discord server some of them have come from my social media if you are interested in sending me some questions and stuff like that you can do it by becoming a patreon and you can send me uh, questions through the discord server we actually have a lot of fun on there and we, we all have chats about Pokemon and and whatnot um so if you if you want to then uh, come along and enjoy the conversation um so the first question i've got here is from secret lawyer man and he says what is your opinion on shinies and would i do shinies in the future well <laughs> i get that question a lot and rightfully so like you know a lot of people want to see some shinies and some of my favorite pokemon are shinies to be fair like uh shiny charizard i know it's a bit cliche but i do love him black charizard with red wings that's so cool the first part of the uh, question what's my opinion on shinies i generally do quite like shinies i love the concept of shinies that there is kind of like this color aberration in them similar to how you know you get um albinoism or uh large amounts of melatonin so you get an all black uh, animal um i think those are really cool and i like the concept of shinies the only thing i think about shinies that does bug me is that pokemon clearly at some point just went through and changed the hue and saturation and ended up with a lot of weird green versions for some reason Whereas I feel like maybe if they'd gone through and actually thought about what the colour schemes could be, maybe even adding patterns or something along the lines, would have made some really cool shinies. Um, I think they started, looking at something like uh, Shiny Charizard, I think maybe that's what they started with. And they were like, oh, that looks really cool. And then they realised they had to do that with all of them. And they just thought, well, I just can't really be bothered to go through and, and spend that kind of amount of manpower going through and redesigning a load of a load of these pokemon so they just kind of ended up tweaking the color saturation i do as i said i do like some of them i think they're really cool but if they if there was an opportunity for them to go back and, and change some of them do some like extra rare shinies or something along those lines that would be very cool 
and would I do shinies in the future? I'm going to say no for now, and I know that sounds disappointing, but you have to kind of put yourself in my shoes. If I did shinies, that would require me to go back through, because if I just do one, everyone's going to want all of them done. So it would require me to go back through and do slightly different coloured versions of all of the pictures I've already done and to and also like you know some people say like oh well, you could just go back through your old pictures and, and tweak the colors and I'm like yeah but that's you know if I'm gonna do it I want to do it properly I'd want to go through and do like a new a new picture to make it actually interesting and worth my time but at the same time it's not worth my time if that makes sense because there's just so many to do um I'm not saying I won't um so for for example if someone wants a commission of a shiny pokemon 100 percent whatever you want pokemon wise i i will do it if you want it as a shiny teddy ursa or whatever I, i'll do it that's absolutely fine as part of the um overall series um probably not um maybe i'll do some one-off ones if i do any ones for charity or if i do some like special edition ones or something along those lines then maybe i'll do some shiny ones um again Shining Charizard is my favourite so I might do that one at some point but in general I don't want to kind of open that Pandora's box if you know what I mean because then it will just snowball and people want more and more and more and I always say would you rather me spend a load of time doing the same pictures that I've already done just slightly different colours or would you rather that I spend the time making new Pokemon and I think I'd like to think that most people would say they want to see new Pokemon so that's where I'm going to put my focus I'm afraid so yeah um, so I've got another question here from Mark Scoopy if I could have the same level of success that I've had with Pokemon Zoology but with something else what would it be and why I think that's a really interesting question because you know it's something that I've thought about a lot mainly because you know I know like Pokemon Zoology has been amazing and it's a wonderful project and so many people love it and it's brought in loads of work for me and got my name out there and it's just been a godsend it's been absolutely fantastic but I always know that it's got a limit you know because it isn't my IP these are all fan this is fan art essentially so what I would like to do I mean like if I could have had the same success but with something else it would probably still be in the same realm doing creatures or monsters or whatever just something that was my ip um something that i that there wasn't a ceiling to and something that i could really develop and move forward with and expand and grow and you know turn into a proper business whereas i with pokemon i'm always going to have limitations and you know quite rightly it's their it's their product this is just this is a a love letter to pokemon i guess um and a, and a love letter to all of those people who are similar ages to me or, and and have always wanted to see pokemon to like grow with them if that makes sense so yeah i just kind of filling a niche and i know a lot of people will say well you know there's detective P pikachu now and blah 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 and i'm like yeah there is and detective pikachu is, is and fantastic and the people that worked on it have done a uh, done a brilliant job but it is still keeping in the same realms as the original pokemon you know they are still what i would call living cartoons um and that's not necessarily a bad thing like you know you are dealing with so, like a huge fan base like some would argue almost bigger than disney so you know you've got to keep it in that realm we've already seen what happened with something like sonic where someone's kind of uh stepped outside of the bounds um and it just did not go well so i think with with pokemon i completely understood and respected their direction that they went for um, with Detective Pikachu um, and it was a fun film you know a lot of people enjoyed it but it wasn't the kind of realism the gritty realism that um, what I've kind of aimed for in in my work um, I know that I haven't I still keep it within the realms of Pokemon like you know I they still I still try and keep them as close to the original designs as possible but I still want to bring a level of realism to it that's just a little bit leaning away from the kind of cartoony aspect so yeah going back to the original question um i think i would have i would create something people would love in the realms of monsters and mythology and all that kind of stuff and there's actually something that i've been playing with myself actually um over the years 
hopefully once I start, you know, introducing that stuff, there'll be still a large amount of my fan base that will enjoy that. And hopefully I can grow that because sadly I can't be doing Pokemon for the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> cause I would be doing it for the rest of my life if, uh, if I continue. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people say to me like, Oh, are you, are you going to go on to the second generation? Are you going to go on to further generation? Um, as I've said, any commissions, I'm happy to do that right now. There's no plans to move on to the, any, any of the other generations. I want to kind of wrap gen one up in a nice neat bow and once i've kind of done that and i've got maybe i'll bring out some books and some stuff like that for you guys to grab then i'll have a serious thought about where i'm going to be moving um and if i'm gonna if i'm gonna continue doing the project and in what capacity i'll be doing that and then i've got a question here from the perfect hell if i lived in the pokemon world what would i do for a living well, it depends. So if I if I imagine myself as if I was born in the Pokemon world and I grew up in the Pokemon world, I'd probably end up being like a Pokemon researcher, like in my stories, to be honest. I know a lot of people would be like, oh, well, of course, why not? Why wouldn't you be a Pokemon trainer? And I think, well, quite frankly, I just, I don't think in reality, I would like to see animals fighting each other. I just think it would upset me, <laughs> quite honestly. So I'd just be far more fascinated in what they are and where they come from and, and how they survive and you know how their abilities work and all that kind of stuff so I mean that's part and the parcel why I love doing Pokemon Zoology because it's kind of like me exploring that world with you of course along along the way and but if it was me now just like suddenly woke up one morning I was in the Pokemon world besides from having a full-blown meltdown um, I I think I'd probably end up just doing what I'm doing now. Um, who knows? Maybe doing actual animals from our world, and that would be their fantasy. Who knows? Yeah, I'd just stick with my talents. So yeah, so guys, that was Pokemon Zoology podcast PZP this month. I hope you've learned some interesting things and and you know looked at my artwork slightly differently or how my process works. As always, if you want to become a patron, there's loads of really cool. Um, stuff on there you can get merchandise you can get behind the scenes stuff you can get pictures early you get the stories that I write I do I write some more detailed elements that you don't see on social media there's the discord server yeah loads and loads of stuff so I, I, I recommend going and having having a check through some of those things talking of uh, patreon I just want to give a shout out to some of my patreon supporters so we've got Bridget D Laurent Sam Simmons, Bo Garber, Nikki Wolf, Bonnie Doritsky, Exodus, Exodus, <laughs> um, Erin, Chris Soul, and Jamie Dunbar. So, guys, thank you all so much for your support. It really means the world to me. And uh, yeah, if you just want to get some prints and whatnot, I've got uh, my Etsy store. There'll be a link in the description so you, you can uh, check those out and grab some prints maybe if you want. And yeah, I hope you guys are having a wonderful time and enjoying the project uh, follow me on social media and check out my youtube i've got loads of videos about how i make my creatures so um i hope you enjoy those thanks again see you bye